Section 16 of Jataka Tales by H. T. Francis and E. J. Thomas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pennywise Monkey. Once upon a time, when Brahmadatta was reigning in Benares, he had a counsellor who was his right-hand man and gave him advice in things spiritual and temporal. There was a rising on the frontier, and the troops there stationed sent the king a letter. The king started, rainy season though it was, and formed a camp in his park. The Bodhisatta stood before the king. At that moment the people had steamed some peas for the horses, and poured them out into a trough. One of the monkeys that lived in the park jumped down from a tree, filled his mouth and hands with the peas, then up again, and sitting down in the tree he began to eat. As he ate, one pea fell from his hand upon the ground. Down dropped at once all the peas from his hand and mouth, and down from the tree he came, to hunt for the lost pea. But that pea he could not find. So he climbed up his tree again, and sat still, very glum, looking like someone who had lost a thousand in some lawsuit. The king observed how the monkey had done, and pointed it out to the bodhisatta. "'Friend, what do you think of that?' he asked, to which the bodhisatta made answer. "'King, this is what fools of little wit are wont to do. They spend a pound to win a penny.' and he went on to repeat the first stanza. A foolish monkey living in the trees, O king, when both his hands were full of peas, has thrown them all away to look for one. There is no wisdom, sire, in such as these. Then the bodhisatta approached the king, and, addressing him again, repeated the second stanza. Such are we, O mighty monarch, such all those that greedy be, losing much to gain a little, like the monkey and the pea. On hearing this address, the king turned and went straight back to Benares, and the outlaws, hearing that the king had set forth from his capital to make mincemeat of his enemies, hurried away from the borders. THE INCOMPARABLE ARCHER Once upon a time, when Brahmadatta was king of Benares, the Bodhisatta was conceived as the son of the queen consort. She was safely delivered, and on his name-day they gave him the name of Asadisa Kumara, Prince Peerless. About the time he was able to walk, the queen conceived one who was also to be a good being. She was safely delivered, and on the name-day they called the babe Brahmadatta Kumara, or Prince Heaven-Sent. When Prince Peerless was sixteen, he went to Takasila for his education— there, at the feet of a world-famed teacher, he learnt the three Vedas and the eighteen accomplishments. In the science of archery he was peerless, and he returned to Benares. When the king was on his deathbed, he commanded that Prince Peerless should be king in his stead, and Prince Brahmadatta the viceroy. Then he died, after which the kingship was offered to Peerless, who refused, saying that he cared not for it. So they consecrated Brahmadatta to be king by sprinkling him. Peerless cared nothing for glory, and wanted nothing. While the younger brother ruled, Peerless lived in all royal state. The slaves came and slandered him to his brother. "'Prince Peerless wants to be king,' said they. Brahmadatta believed them, and allowed himself to be deceived. He sent some men to take Peerless prisoner." One of Prince Peerless's attendants told him what was afoot. He waxed angry with his brother, and went away into another country. When he arrived there, he sent in word to the king that an archer was come, and awaited him. "'What wages does he ask?' the king inquired. "'A hundred thousand a year.' "'Good,' said the king. "'Let him enter.' Peerless came into the presence, and stood waiting. "'You are the archer?' asked the king. "'Yes, sire. Very well. I take you into my service.' After that, Peerless remained in the service of this king. But the old archers were annoyed at the wage which was given him. "'Too much!' they grumbled. One day it so happened that the king went out into his park. There, at foot of a mango tree, where a screen had been put up before a certain stone seat of ceremony, he reclined upon a magnificent couch. He happened to look up, and there, right at the treetop, he saw a cluster of mango fruit. 
it is too high to climb for thought he so summoning his archers he asked them whether they could cut off yon cluster with an arrow and bring it down for him oh said they that is not much for us to do but your majesty has seen our skill often enough the newcomer is so much better paid than we that perhaps you might make him bring down the fruit then the king sent for peerless and asked him if he could do it oh yes your majesty if i may choose my position what position do you want the place where your couch stands the king had the couch removed and gave place peerless had no bow in his hand he used to carry it underneath his body cloth so he must needs have a screen the king ordered a screen to be brought and spread for him and our archer went in he doffed the white cloth which he wore over all and put on a red cloth next to his skin then he fastened his girdle and donned a red waist cloth from a bag he took out a sword in pieces which he put together and girt on his left side next he put on a mail coat of gold fastened his bow case over his back and took out his great ramshorn bow made in several pieces which he fitted together fixed the bow string red as coral put a turban upon his head twirling the arrow with his nails he threw open the screen and came out looking like a naga prince just emerging from the riven ground he went to the place of shooting arrow set to bow and then put this question to the king your majesty said he am i to bring this fruit down with an upward shot or by dropping the arrow upon it my son said the king i have often seen a mark brought down by the upward shot but never one taken in the fall you had better make the shaft fall on it your majesty said the archer this arrow will fly high up to the heaven of the four great kings it will fly and then return of itself you must please be patient till it returns the king promised then the archer said again your majesty this arrow in its upshot will pierce the stalk exactly in the middle and when it comes down it will not swerve a hair's breadth either way but hit the same spot to a nicety and bring down the cluster with it then he sped the arrow forth swiftly as the arrow went up it pierced the exact center of the mango stalk by the time the archer knew his arrow had reached the place of the four great kings he let fly another arrow with greater speed than the first this struck the feather of the first arrow and turned it back then itself went up as far as the heaven of the thirty-three gods there the deities caught and kept it the sound of the falling arrow as it cleft the air was as the sound of a thunderbolt what is that noise asked every man that is the arrow falling our archer replied the bystanders were all frightened to death for fear the arrow should fall on them but peerless comforted them fear nothing said he and i will see that it does not fall on the earth down came the arrow not a hairbreadth out either way but neatly cut through the stalk of the mango cluster the archer caught the arrow in one hand and the fruit in the other so that they should not fall upon the ground we never saw such a thing before cried the onlookers at this marvel how they praised the great man how they cheered and clapped and snapped their fingers thousands of kerchiefs waving in the air in their joy and delight the courtiers gave presents to peerless amounting to ten millions of money and the king too showered gifts and honors upon him like rain while the bodhisattva was receiving such glory and honor at the hands of this king seven kings who knew that there was no prince peerless in benares drew a leaguer around the city and summoned its king to fight or yield the king was frightened out of his life where is my brother he asked he is in the service of a neighboring king was the reply if my dear brother does not come said he i am a dead man go fall at his feet in my name appease him bring him hither his messengers came and did their errand peerless took leave of his master and returned to benares he comforted his brother and bade him fear nothing then scratched a message upon an arrow to this effect i prince peerless am returned i mean to kill you all with one arrow which i will shoot at you let those who care for life make their escape 
this he shot so that it fell upon the very middle of a golden dish from which the seven kings were eating together when they read the writing they all fled half dead with fright thus did our prince put to flight seven kings without shedding even so much blood as a little fly might drink then looking upon his younger brother he renounced his lusts and forsook the world cultivated the faculties and the attainments and at his life's end came to brahma's heaven the magic treasures once upon a time when brahmadatta was reigning in benares four brahmins brothers of the land of kasi left the world and became hermits they built themselves four huts in a row in the highlands of the himalaya and there they lived the eldest brother died and was born as saka knowing who he had been he used to visit the others every seven or eight days and lend them a helping hand one day he visited the eldest of the anchorites and after the usual greeting took his seat to one side well sir how can i serve you he inquired the hermit who was suffering from jaundice replied fire is what i want saka gave him a razor axe a razor axe is so called because it serves as razor or as axe according as you fit it into the handle why said the hermit who is there to get me firewood with this if you want a fire sir replied saka all you have to do is to strike your hand upon the axe and say fetch wood and make a fire the axe will fetch the wood and make you the fire after giving him this razor axe he next visited the second brother and asked him the same question how can i serve you sir now there was an elephant track by his hut and the creatures annoyed him so he told saka that he was annoyed by elephants and wanted them to be driven away saka gave him a drum if you beat upon this side sir he explained your enemies will run away but if you strike the other they will become your firm friends and will encompass you with an army in fourfold array then he handed him the drum lastly he made a visit to the youngest and asked as before how he could serve him he too had jaundice and what he said was please give me some curds saka gave him a milk bowl with these words turn this over if you want anything and a great river will pour out of it and will flood the whole place and it will be able even to win a kingdom for you with these words he departed after this axe used to make fire for the eldest brother the second used to beat upon one side of his drum and drive the elephants away and the youngest had his curds to eat about this time a wild boar that lived in a ruined village lit upon a gem possessed of magic power picking up the gem in his mouth he rose in the air by its magic from afar he could see an isle in mid-ocean and there he resolved to live so descending he chose a pleasant spot beneath a fig tree and there he made his abode one day he fell asleep under the tree with the jewel lying in front of him now a certain man from the Kasi country, who had been turned out of doors by his parents as a ne'er-do-well, had made his way to a seaport, where he embarked on shipboard as a sailor's drudge. In mid-sea the ship was wrecked, and he floated upon a plank to this island. As he wandered in search of fruit, he espied our boar fast asleep. Quietly he crept up, seized the gem, and found himself by magic rising through the air. He alighted on the fig tree and pondered. The magic of this gem, thought he, has taught yon boar to be a skywalker. That's how he got here, I suppose. Well, I must kill him and make a meal of him first, and then I'll be off. So he snapped off a twig, dropping it upon the boar's head the boar woke up and seeing no gem ran trembling up and down the man up in the tree laughed the boar looked up and seeing him ran his head against the tree and killed himself the man came down lit a fire cooked the boar and made a meal then he rose up in the sky and set out on his journey as he passed over the himalaya he saw the hermit's settlement 
so he descended and spent two or three days in the eldest brother's hut, entertaining and entertained, and he found out the virtue of the axe. He made up his mind to get it for himself, so he showed our hermit the virtue of his gem and offered to exchange it for the axe. The hermit longed to be able to pass through mid-air and struck the bargain. The man took the axe and departed. But before he had gone very far, he struck upon it and said, Axe, smash that hermit's skull and bring the gem to me. Off flew the axe, clove the hermit's skull, and brought the gem back. Then the man hid the axe away and paid a visit to the second brother. With him the visitor stayed a few days and soon discovered the power of his drum. Then he exchanged his gem for the drum, as before, and as before made the axe cleave the owner's skull. After this he went on to the youngest of the three hermits, found out the power of the milk bowl, gave his jewel in exchange for it, and as before sent his axe to cleave the man's skull. Thus he was now owner of jewel, axe, drum, and milk bowl, all four. He now rose up and passed through the air. Stopping hard by Benares, he wrote a letter which he sent by a messenger's hands that the king must either fight him or yield. On receipt of this message, the king sallied forth to seize the scoundrel. But he beat on one side of his drum and was promptly surrounded by an army in fourfold array. When he saw that the king had deployed his forces, he then overturned the milk bowl, and a great river poured forth. Multitudes were drowned in the river of curds. Next he struck upon his axe. "'Fetch me the king's head!' cried he. Away went the axe and came back and dropped the head at his feet. Not a man could raise hand against him. So encompassed by a mighty host, he entered the city and caused himself to be anointed king under the title of King Dadi Vahana, or carried on the Kurds, and ruled righteously. One day, as the king was amusing himself by casting a net into the river, he caught a mango fruit fit for the gods which had floated down from Lake Kanamunda. When the net was hauled out, the mango was found and shown to the king. It was a huge fruit, as big as a basin, round and golden in color. The king asked what the fruit was. Mango, said the foresters. He ate it and had the stone painted in his park and watered with milk water. The tree sprouted up, and in three years it bore fruit. Great was the worship paid to this tree. Milk water was poured about it. Perfumed garlands with five sprays were hung upon it. Wreaths were festooned about it. A lamp was kept burning and fed with scented oil, and all round it was a screen of cloth. The fruit was sweet and had the color of fine gold. King Darivahana, before sending presents of these mangoes to other kings, used to prick with a thorn that place in the stone where the sprout would come from, for fear of their growing the like by planting it. When they ate the fruit, they used to plant the stone, but they could not get it to take root. They inquired the reason, and learned how the matter was. One king asked his gardener whether he could spoil the flavor of this fruit and turn it bitter on the tree. Yes, the man said he could. So his king gave him a thousand pieces and sent him on his errand. So soon as he had arrived in Benares, the man sent a message to the king that a gardener was come. The king admitted him to the presence. After the man had saluted him, the king asked, "'You are a gardener?' "'Yes, sire,' said the man, and began to sound his own praises. "'Very well,' said the king. "'You may go and assist my park-keeper.' So after that, these used both the talk after the royal grounds. The newcomer managed to make the park look more beautiful by forcing flowers and fruit out of their season. This pleased the king, so that he dismissed the former keeper and gave the park into sole charge of the new one. No sooner had this man got the park into his own hands than he planted nims and creepers about the choice mango tree. By and by the nims sprouted up, above and below, root with root, and branch with branch, 
these were all entangled with the mango tree thus this tree with its sweet fruit grew bitter as the bitter-leaved nim by the company of this noxious and sour plant as soon as the gardener knew that the fruit had gone bitter he took to his heels king dadi vahana went a-walking in his pleasance and took a bite of the mango fruit the juice in his mouth tasted like nasty nim swallow it he could not so he coughed and spat it out now at that time the bodhisatta was his temporal and spiritual counsellor the king turned to him why sir this tree is as carefully cared for as ever and yet its fruit has gone bitter what's the meaning of it and asking this question he repeated the first stanza sweet was once the mango's savour sweet its scent its colour gold what has caused this bitter flavour for we tend it as of old the bodhisatta explained the reason in the second stanza round about the trunk entwining branch with branch and root with root see the bitter creeper climbing that is what has spoiled your fruit so you see bad company will make the better follow suit on hearing this the bodhisatta caused all the nims and creepers to be removed and their roots pulled up the noxious soil was all taken away and the sweet earth put in its place and the tree was carefully fed with sweet water milk water scented water then by absorbing all this sweetness its fruit grew sweet again the king put his former gardener in charge of the park and after his life was done passed away to fare according to his deserts end of section sixteen